It is said by some that form follows function. While this statement originated from an architect, Lewis Sullivan to be exact, its veracity is by no means confined to architecture. A number of biologists are rather fond of the phrase. After all, form also follows function where living things are concerned. This applies to cellular structures, the organization of organs, and the overall morphology of a species. At the risk of sounding repetitive, simplistic, and almost tautological, a bird looks like a bird because a bird's form is what is needed to live the way a bird does. More specifically, for example, the shape of a bird's beak reflects the sort of food it consumes. The shape of a bird's wings reflects the manner in which it flies, or does not fly in a few cases at least. As it takes a certain form to live in a certain way, species that live in similar ways will have similar forms. When these species come from significantly different taxonomic groups, this phenomenon is known as convergent evolution. So, just for fun, let us look at a fairly extreme example of convergent evolution. There are only two major groups of animal life with species that have completely adapted to land and achieved powered flight. These groups are the amniote vertebrates, also known as reptiles, birds, and mammals, and the insects. It would be difficult to envision forms of complex animal life that are any more different. Yet, we do see a remarkable convergence in the families of Trochilidae and Sphingidae, more commonly known as hummingbirds and hawk moths. To begin with, it is worth mentioning why insects and amniotes are so fundamentally different on so many levels. Part of the reason has to do with their different evolutionary paths and histories. The insect body plan, while versatile, still retains the same basic set of six legs, four wings, two antennae, six mouthparts, and three general body regions. Similarly, while amniotes are incredibly diverse, a closer look at the mammals in particular reveals skeletons with nearly identical underlying bones stretched into radically different shapes. Both groups must remain within the limits of their genetic background. The other major reason for the differences between these two groups is a matter of size. Even a casual observer is likely to notice that amniotes are generally larger than insects often quite a bit larger. While there is a narrow range of overlap, there are no insects that grow larger than even a moderately sized amniote. At the same time, there are no amniotes smaller than moderately sized insects. As it happens, a physics tends to change a bit with size. The body structures of an amniote work quite well within the range of amniote body sizes. The body structures of an insect work best within the range of insect body sizes. So now we come to the matter of hawk moths and hummingbirds. Most of the former are among the larger moth species, while the latter include the smallest of bird species. Both of these groups live mainly as nectarivores, at least as adults, and travel between flowers using a distinctive pattern of flight. This pattern involves extraordinarily rapid wing beats, and tends to produce a low buzzing sort of drone as the creature travels through the air. They are capable of rapid changes in direction, remarkable turns of speed, and true stationary hovering while they imbibe nectar. To support this flight pattern, these two groups have remarkably similar body shapes. The body itself is oblong and fairly stout overall, one might call it fusiform. There is a covering of insulation contributing to a relatively streamlined appearance. The wings have a narrow, roughly triangular outline. Feeding structures are long and thin, at least while extended in the case of the hawk moths. The eyes are relatively large and advanced. Though their modes of life are very similar, hummingbirds and hawk moths do not fill identical ecological niches. Apart from the possibility of visiting different species of flower, there is also the matter of time. Hummingbirds are active during the day, while most hawk moths are nocturnal or crepuscular. That is, they are active either at night or around dawn and dusk. By doing something much like working different shifts, 
The competition between these two groups is greatly reduced, and there is room enough for both groups to coexist quite easily. This difference in schedule is only the beginning. Despite their outward similarities, there are a great many other differences encompassing virtually every aspect of these creatures. Put simply, a hummingbird remains a bird, and a hawk moth remains a moth. The differences between these two forms of life are reflected in the differences between these superficially similar creatures. Many of these differences are made readily apparent by a bit of comparative anatomy and physiology. To begin with, let us consider the skeletomuscular system. As with other vertebrates, a hummingbird's skeleton consists of rigid bones made of a combination of collagen and hydroxyapatite crystals. These are connected by flexible collagenous ligaments and operated by opposing muscle groups to produce coordinated movement. The skeleton of a hawk moth is an exoskeleton, consisting of layers of chitin, an unusual polysaccharide, combined with various proteins, and wrapped up in a thin outer layer of wax. This integument is divided into rigid plates and small flexible regions between said plates. As with the hummingbirds, opposing muscle groups connect to the rigid elements and contract to produce coordinated movement. The digestive systems are similar in their overall shape, that is, a tube within the length of the body. However, the fine details are rather different. In insects, the front and back portions of the gut are lined with a thin, flexible version of the outer exoskeleton. The midgut is protected from abrasion and microbial assaults by the continuous production of a porous, peritrophic membrane. This membrane is essentially a tube within the digestive tube, slowly produced at the front and broken down at the back. In contrast, a vertebrate digestive system simply relies upon a coating of mucus and rapid epithelial regeneration. As an interesting aside, insects are not capable of producing mucus, thus the need for all of the other structural adaptations within their digestive tracts. At the front, the feeding apparatus is also quite distinct. The hummingbird's apparatus consists mainly of a pair of jaws modified into a long, thin beak perfect for extracting nectar from the depths of a flower, but also serviceable in capturing small insect prey. With the hawk moths, as with other Lepidoptera, the mouth parts are modified from the usual group of six found in other insects. Two mouth parts, the maxillae, are greatly elongated. To be more specific, a part of each maxilla known as the galea is elongated. These structures fit together to collectively form a coiled proboscis with a hollow channel. This structure can be extended by internal hemolymph pressure to become a long, thin feeding tube, much like the beak of a hummingbird. The circulatory and respiratory systems are remarkably different between these two groups. In a hummingbird, there is a four-chambered heart in the thoracic cavity that beats roughly 20 times per second. It is more like a heart buzz than a heart beat. This moves blood through the body at considerable speed, and this blood includes the respiratory pigment hemoglobin. As such, it functions in the delivery of oxygen to the body tissues as well as other nutrients. This oxygen is obtained via the lungs. In birds, the lungs consist of a series of finely branched tubes that converge at an inlet on one end and an outlet on the other. Unlike the lungs of other amniotes, where the air simply enters and exits from the same aperture, bird lungs are arranged so that the air passes completely through. This means that oxygen is extracted very efficiently, a necessity for powered flight. A series of air sacs are inflated in a sequence to move air effectively through the lungs, rather than merely moving the air in and out. In contrast, the heartbeat of a hawk moth might reach up to three or four beats per second at most. The heart is little more than a tube running up the back of the abdomen and feeding forward into an aorta. There are no other vessels, as insects have open circulatory systems. The hemolymph is sucked into the heart through a series of openings along its length and pumped forward into the head. It then flows over into between the organs towards the back of the body. This system is far too inefficient for effective oxygen delivery. Fortunately, the circulatory system in insects is not concerned with oxygen delivery. Instead, the respiratory system handles this directly. 
Rather than a discrete pair of lungs, the insect body is permeated by a network of branching air tubes that arise from two rows of openings down the sides of its body. Air is delivered directly to all body tissues, diffusing across a thin lining of cuticle in the smallest of these air tubes. Air sacs are also present to facilitate internal air circulation. The nervous systems of these two groups are similar to a degree in that there is a brain in the head and a nerve cord going down the length of the body. However, the nerve cord in hummingbirds is dorsally located and encased in a protective spinal column. The nerve cord in hawk moths is ventrally located, and rather than being a continuous structure, it consists of multiple ganglia connected by paired nerve cords. Each of these ganglia functions as a sort of subordinate brain, coordinating most of the functions for its body segment. The senses are also rather different. The sense of smell in birds is handled by a nasal cavity connected with the respiratory system. A pair of antennae fill this role in moths. The eyes of birds are simple, using a single lens to form an image on a retina. The eyes of moths are compound, with many distinct lenses. Each of these lenses directs light to a few sensory cells. These pieces do not form an image by themselves, but instead they form something more akin to a single pixel on a computer screen. Just as several hundred pixels can come together to form an image, so several hundred of these individual omatidia collectively form an image in a compound eye. The sense of touch in a bird is relatively direct, as the skin can detect things like pressure and temperature changes and so on. In insects, the body is effectively encased in armor. Thus, much of the sense of touch is handled by sensory hairs that connect to slender neurons passing through the exoskeleton. Other sensory hairs are porous and capable of detecting chemicals. These allow for a sense of smell and a sense of taste and are typically found on antennae and mouth parts, though some insects also have taste receptors on their feet. There is another more subtle difference that is more a matter of physiology than easily observed anatomy. Hummingbirds are endothermic, at least during the day, maintaining high internal body temperatures at considerable energy cost. This cost is so high that they would starve in a single night if they didn't enter a state of torpor or hibernation. They need to effectively enter suspended animation every night to avoid starving to death. In contrast, hawk moths are ectothermic, at least while not in flight, with body temperatures quite close to their surroundings. This is certainly easier on the energy budget, but there is a problem here as well. A certain minimal temperature is required for the flight muscles to operate well enough to keep the creature in the air. This is all the more troublesome as most hawk moth species tend to be active at night, or around dawn and dusk, when temperatures are often a bit on the low side. The solution to this is surprisingly straightforward. The moth shivers to warm itself up. More precisely, it temporarily uncouples its wings from its flight muscles and rapidly contracts these muscles. It wouldn't be enough to allow for flight if they were properly linked up, but it is enough to generate heat. Every muscle contraction generates heat as an inevitable side effect. This heat is kept within the body by a thick layer of insulating hairs, particularly on the thorax. This is why hawk moths are fuzzy. Once the creature has warmed up its proverbial engine, it extends its wings and takes to the air. While these differences are all rather extensive, they pale in comparison to the developmental differences. A hummingbird hatches from an egg as a chick, which might be regarded as an incomplete version of the adult. That is, it has the same basic body structure as the adult, but the details are largely undeveloped at first. It is dependent upon its parents for food, generally a combination of nectar and small insects, brought to the nest. Typically, each nest contains two chicks. The food is delivered in the usual way for birds, from the parental crop to an open gullet. Still, the long, narrow beak of a hummingbird parent makes the overall spectacle a bit reminiscent of sword swallowing. Thankfully for the parent, the chick's beaks are relatively short and blunt. Thus, the parent isn't likely to have an eye put out by the misplaced eagerness of hungry offspring. Hawk moths also hatch from eggs, but there are a few key differences. The eggs are smaller, and there are a lot more of them. What hatches from the egg looks nothing like the adult. A tiny caterpillar is a far cry from an adult moth. 
The caterpillars seek out their own food, typically subsisting on whatever plant their mother laid her eggs on. Without parental care, they have a higher mortality rate, but then again, there were more of them to begin with. Rather than slowly developing from an incomplete form to a fully realized adult, the caterpillar simply grows in size, and might change its proportions just a little. Incidentally, the caterpillars of sphingid moths nearly always have a single spine at the back of their body. As such, they are sometimes known as hornworms. As with many other insect groups, the caterpillar eventually enters a pupal stage, where its body is radically rearranged into the adult pattern. The adult that emerges from the pupa requires only a little while for its exoskeleton to harden. Afterwards, it is fully capable of the aerial acrobatics seen in both hawk moths and hummingbirds. It is remarkable how two groups with so many differences are able to converge so closely in their basic appearance. Form follows function, and where similar functions are found, similar forms should be expected. Still, this does not negate the multitude of underlying differences inherent to these two distinct forms of life. Thank you for listening. I hope you have enjoyed this brief glimpse into the more unusual side of the natural world. If you wish to know more, here are a few things that might be worth looking into. If you found this enjoyable, feel free to leave a like. If you think others would enjoy this content, by all means, share. If you have something to say or ask about, honest comments are always welcome. If you wish to see more from this channel, a subscription would be most helpful. Until next time.